Minister, we've got Mr. Ebonlu Adigboro, our Senior Advocate of Nigeria, joining us this morning. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, we heard the Minister of Police Affairs just explaining why uh, the extension of the IGP by the President had to happen. They need time uh, to ensure that they have the right persons there and ensure things work properly, smooth handover. So uh, just trying to let people know that they not just there to do things blatantly, but the reasons he had used. Does that sit with you, notwithstanding? Uh, good morning, Chebalin and uh, viewers. Uh, I have listened to the reasons profiled by the Honorable Minister of Police Affairs on behalf of the President uh, on why Mr. Muhammad Adamu uh, is to remain in office as the Inspector General of Police. I think generally uh, there is a desire uh, to ensure that there must be some kind of seamless transition in any official position, not just for the IGP, but other desirable positions of public office holders. But if you recall that Mr. Adamo was appointed on the 15th of January 2019 as Inspector General of Police, the 20th in the series. So I, I believe that uh, the president had enough time uh, because he was aware that his tenure uh, was going to expire on February and that he will have attained 35 years of service in the force by February 1, having enlisted in the Nigerian police force in 1986. So his public records are in the public domain. It's on Wikipedia. You just Google, you will be able to get the record of the uh, Inspector General of Police. He's 59 years of age. You know, and the law says that, I mean, for a person who is an officer in the Nigeria police force, I'm, and I'm referring to Section 18, uh, sub 8 of the Police Act that the President signed by himself on the 13th of September 2020. That law says that any officer of the Nigeria Police Force can only serve for 35 years mandatory period of service or when he attains the age of 60, whichever is earlier. So in this case, the mandatory period of service came earlier than uh, the 60 years uh, of the Inspector General of Police. So the law takes the 35 years that he has rendered meritoriously to the Nigeria Police Force uh, as being the time when he should vacate office. So I do not agree that the need for uh, seamless transition should warrant uh, the reason for somebody whose tenure has expired to remain in office. And in any way, Chebalin, for you to do anything that relates to the office of the Inspector General of Police, you must follow due process. There is a procedure stipulated by law for the appointment of the Inspector General of Police, and that is in Section 216 of the Police Act. And it's very clear that it's only a member of the Nigeria Police Force that can be appointed as Inspector General of Police, not just a member, but a serving member. So by February 1, 2021, the Mr. Mohamed Adamo ceased to be a member of the Nigeria Police Force, having served that five years in, uh, in that uh, uh, organization. So there is no basis, there's no foundation to bring him back through the back door to extend a tenure that has expired. And in any case, if you look at your tenancy agreement or lease agreement or any document of property that is subject to renewal, you give notice of renewal before the expiration of the tenure. So assuming that it's even possible to extend the tenure of a serving inspector general of police, that extension will only happen during the subsistence or validity of the tenure itself. So once you wait for the tenure to expire, there's no basis, there's no foundation for the extension. And like I've explained practically I mean, yesterday, you can only extend what exists. There is no law empowering the president to extend the tenure of 
an inspector general of police that has expired. And so I believe that when you do something that is wrong, you cannot seek for right motive to justify it. So with due respect to the Honorable Minister of uh, Police Affairs, you would not use exigency as a reason to perpetrate illegality. What has happened is clearly unconstitutional. The president swore to uphold the constitution, and that is what we hold him to, and he has to obey the constitution. So it's not that we don't like Mr. Adamu, having served in the police for 35 years, without any query, without any dent on his image, he should be allowed to take a meritorious uh, exit without any controversy. You know, and if you look at the police force, in all the units, AIGs, DIGs, you can't say you can't have somebody you can appoint in acting capacity for an interim period until you can convey the uh, proper meeting of the Nigerian Police Council, who would then advise having interviewed all the existing officers that are qualified for that position. So certainly it cannot be the case that there is nobody among the serving AIGs, among the serving DIGs, that should qualify to hold that office for an interim period of one month or three months or for however, however long the president wants to cite for a suitable person. Right. It is totally embarrassing, if I must say. Right. I mean, and it's all the more important to follow the law because this is a law enforcement agency. This is an agency tasked with the responsibility of upholding the law. But you also said that, I mean, waiting till his tenure expired before extending that tenure by uh, three months, I mean, is an illegality. Is there, is there any, uh, I mean, is there any instance maybe that this can be legal? Is there any instance? When you say that something is legal, it means that there is a backing for it in law. We can search for statutes here and there. And when we want to do that, we'll look at the enabling statute, applicable statute that regulates that office. In this case, we have recourse to the Constitution and also to the Police Act. And like I've explained, the basis of the existence of the office of the IG is created by the Constitution in Section 215 which says that there shall be an inspector general of police to be appointed by the president upon the advice of the Nigeria Police Council. And such person should be picked from among seven officers of the Nigeria Police Force. So when we leave that, we can then go to the police act to search for the definition or the tenor or the appointment or recruitment of the office of the inspector general of police. Uh, and, and that is clearly stated that such a person uh, should be appointed on the advice of the Nigerian Police Council. Now, the Police Council is established under paragraph 27 of the third schedule to the 1999 Constitution as an organization that is responsible for advising the president on the organization of the police and the appointment or removal of the Inspector General of Police. That organization is in existence. Its membership includes the president himself, who is the chairman, all the governors of the states of the federation are members of the Nigerian Police Council. The chairman of the Police Service Commission is a member. And then the inspector general of police himself, when he's still in office, he should be a member. In this age of technology, it shouldn't be difficult for the president to summon uh, an online or virtual meeting of the Nigerian Police Council to seek their advice. And what the law says is an advice, which is not binding on him. It was just to put to be a complimentary opportunity for him to tap knowledge from the governors who are the chief security officers of their states, tap knowledge from the chairman of the police service commission who is responsible for the recruitment promotion of officers of the Nigerian police force. So they will look at the rank and file and be able to advise the president to shortlist some names for his uh, uh, choice. But not having done that, there's no basis at all, either for the appointment of an acting inspector general or for the purported extension of the tenure of the retired inspector general of police, because that is the rank of Mr. Mohamed Adamu now. As of today, he has retired. And having retired, for you to be able to bring him back into the force, he has to reapply. He has to go for training at the police college. He has to go through promotion before he will become an AIG or a DIG. 
you know, so you, you don't just do things whimsically according to how a president wakes up or what he thinks, with all due respect to Mr. President. And I appreciate the challenges he may be having, having just replaced the other service chiefs in the armed forces, in the army, in the Navy, and the Air Force. But I think we do things according to law. And by now, the president, you appreciate that Nigerians want him to always follow the due process of law. So answering your question, there's no other platform we can go to. There's no other venue we can go to to search for laws to uh, justify the illegal extension Mm. of the tenor of an um, inspector general of police that has retired. You know, you, you, you referred to the service chiefs as well, and a lot of people are saying, well, a similar thing played out with the service chiefs. I mean, there were a lot of people that said that they were due for retirement anyway, but the president still held on to them. So is this any different? And some are saying, well, if you didn't maybe take this to court then, so maybe this would fly as well. Well, you see, the problem is that in a nation that is governed by democracy, we have conventions, we have practices that we cherish to oil the will of democracy. And that is to respect institutions and laws. I mean, look at what is happening in America, where institutions that are established by law defended the constitution and defended the country. And that's what should happen here. Our institutions should be more than individuals. With all due respect to Mr. Mohamed Adamu, who has performed so gallantly, with all respect to him for the period for which he has had office as the Inspector General of Police, I don't think we can say that if he leaves the office, the Nigerian police force as an entity will collapse. And so we cannot come back to justify uh, the extension of his tenure with what happened to the service chiefs. As a matter of fact, I think that with what we read yesterday about the alleged appointment of the service chiefs into non-career ambassadorial positions, it's just clear that the, the president is not having the benefit of, uh, with, will I say, proper legal counsel, with all due respect. Because, you know, these are people that have just been uh, uh, relieved of their office. And packages were announced as to how many cars they were to be entitled to, medical benefits, uh, they are to go with their uniform, with their rifles, all manner of uh, uh, monetary packages. So I, I believe that for us as individuals, we should honor the laws that regulate the institutions and not continue to observe them in violation. And so my own counsel to the president, with all due respect, is that the fact that no court action uh, was instituted in respect of the uh, service chiefs in the armed forces shouldn't be a basis for replicating that unconstitutionality for other offices, especially with regard to the security situation in the country now. You know, because the consequence of this is that, you know, you, you then weaken morale. You know, because when somebody is occupying office illegally, it has to do with the capacity to pass decisions and enforce them. How to inspire people to believe that beyond the announcement by the president. There is a law backing up that office. And once there so, is no such law, even if the person is staying there, it's difficult for people to respect his decisions and his actions. You know, two, two things come up there. Uh, first is that, I mean, people have been thinking about that as well because the vice president is there, is a professor of law, senior advocate of Nigeria, the attorney general, senior advocate of Nigeria, the Minister of State for Labor, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and then you just think, oh, wait a minute, how come? You know, these things are still observed in the breach as you're pointing out. And then secondly, does that then mean that whatever he does in office now, having the benefit of these three months in office, will it be legal since it's uh, by law is not supposed to be there, as you say? Well, uh, you know that we say it in law that you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stand. It must collapse. Ex nihilo nihil fit. Whatever has no basis or foundation cannot stand. So in that regard, I believe that from February 1, uh, midnight, uh, Mr. Mohamed Adamu ceases to be a member of the Nigerian police force. And if he's not a serving member of the police force, he has no basis to be appointed as the Inspector General of Police, either for three months or for one day. So as we speak this morning, the Federal Republic of Nigeria has no 
Inspector General of Police, properly so recognized by law. But I have spoken by law. That's the jury. But in fact, it's possible for the president to retain anybody in whatever capacity as the uh, commander-in-chief of the armed forces as he pleases him, with all due respect. But when we say legality, it has to do with enforcement. It has to do with the regard we have to decisions that are to be taken by the person occupying that office. How does he appoint people? How does he promote people? How does he preside over meetings of the board of the Nigeria Police Force? How does he earn salary? I mean, where, does he, where, where will he draw his allowances from the Consolidated Revenue Fund or from the Revenue uh, Allocation and uh, Fiscal Commission? Where hmm. does he get paid? Okay. You know? So and then yeah. secondly, on to the other issue that you raised about uh, senior advocates serving uh, 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 with, the, with the president. Like I told you, uh, the Nigeria Police Service Commission has the responsibility to advise the president concerning the appointment or removal of an IGP. All the persons you've mentioned are not statutory members of that organization, even though they are available to advise the president. But we cannot hold them accountable since the law does not give them that responsibility mm. uh, to so advise. Well, you, you said just, just a little while ago, you said that as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, the president may have the authority to retain anyone in office beyond time. That's, you know, I mean, that's what he just said now. Wouldn't that, is there a law that backs up that? And wouldn't that be the premise upon which the president is standing then? No, I, we hold the president by his declaration. When a person has on his own declared the basis of the decision, we cannot be searching for an alternative. The minister, Honorable Minister of Police Affairs, spoke on behalf of the president and said, the reason for this extension is that the president wants to be able to get a suitable replacement and is looking for enough time to search for, you know. And, and that's the point I made uh, when I started, to say that this is somebody who was appointed since January 15, 2019. At the time of his appointment, the day of his retirement was already known. His age was already known. So the president had a whole year to have decided on who will be the successor. So I believe because, like uh, uh, Kyle just said, probably because nobody challenged the legal extension of the uh, tenure of office of the service chiefs in the armed forces, it became then comfortable to replicate it in this instance. And I think that's why Nigerians are saying enough is enough. The fact that something is being done wrongly yesterday should not justify why it should continue today. Okay. And that's why it's important for Nigerians to rise up and challenge this in court okay. so that there will be interpretation. Mr. Okay, well, uh, one, one then yes. who wonder whether or not uh, that is going to happen, that you or anyone would want to take the president to court on that. But I was going to take you up on the one of the sections that you quoted. Section 216, sub 2, says, Before making any appointment to the office of the Inspector General of Police or removing him from office, the president shall consult the Nigeria Police Council. Talking about that council, uh, one of the challenges a number of people have raised as a result of that one is that there is no specific time of meeting for the council. It's only at the call of the president. I mean, at least that's the understanding that is out there. Could that be contributory to why, you know, the IGP's uh, agenda never came into discussion because maybe if the meetings had held, it would have been an agenda. It's something that could have been considered in time. Is that, could that be a contributory reason? No, 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 not at all. There's no basis for that. On Wednesday this week, the Federal Executive Council met and was presided over by the president. The constitution only says that the president shall meet regularly with his ministers as Federal Executive Council. So they chose Wednesdays as their statutory period weekly. And so I believe that within the Secretariat of the Nigerian Police Council, he must have an office. There is a chairman prescribed by law who is the president himself, that is governors of the states, and then the chairman of the Police Service Commission. So it couldn't be that those are just matters of procedure. And procedure cannot overrun statutory requirements to say that the meeting should be convened and then an advice should come. And look, it's so simple. Advice in law 
it's not something that is binding on the president. But the makers of the constitution feel that as an individual, just one person, it's possible that there are errors, there are mistakes. You may bypass some persons that are known to others that you never countenance. So by the time you have the benefit of 36 state governors who have the responsibility of all the areas commands, all the DPOs, all the uh, various police uh, commissions, they can properly then put in their own uh, counsel and advise the president. And then you go to the chairman of the police service commission who has the data of all police officers and can tender them before the president. It's just an advice. So I think properly uh, looking back, uh, the president has not acted well with all due respect and should withdraw the purported extension of the tenure of office of the Special General Police. And I'm sure Nigerians, activists, lawyers, students, and teachers of law should be able to uh, approach the courts for a proper interpretation of the action of the president so that it doesn't become a, pres a precedent. Maybe when we get to 2023, we may then be talking about extending the tenure of the president himself by implication. So it's important that we have a judicial determination of this so that we can continue to then oil our democracy and be guided by law at all appropriate times. Well, if that were to happen, I can assure you that you will definitely hear the voices of politicians extending the president's tenure in 2023. No, I'm sure there will have been an alarm way before 2023 expiration approaches. Uh, but looking at it, some people will say, what if the letter was uh, backdated? Or maybe the letter was already in existence, we just didn't know about it. After all, it's only for three months, just so that, you know, he can set in motion the process uh, for electing a new or for getting a new IGP? Because you must admit that somehow it does look like the process is a bit cumbersome. Do you agree? Hey, well, I agree with the latter part of your uh, comment, Malcolm, that that process is quite very, very elaborate and complicated in regard to the fact of the kind of responsibilities attached to that office. Somebody presiding over all police officers law enforcement agencies and responsible for the security of the nation. So I, I agree that the president needs some counsel, some caution. And I think that's why the makers of the constitution have given him this latitude to be able to tap from the well of the experience and wisdom of the governors of 36 states, uh, the chairman of the police service commission, and indeed the IGP himself. But addressing the first part of your uh, comment about whether a letter is already in existence, you know, I mean, with all due respect, if that letter had existed, it should have been known before February 1, when the tenor expired. So since the police um, minister, the minister of police affairs, rather, made the announcement only yesterday, the law takes it that that decision was taken yesterday. So if you write the letter and backdate it, I mean, it's so clear to all that it will be questionable. It will be clear that it was backdated for the purpose of justifying the announcement that was made yesterday. And the point we make in any case is this. That backdating will not even validate it because there is no foundation for it in law. You must have a reason. You must have a legal backing for saying, I want to extend your tenure. And the point I made while I was speaking with your colleagues in Lagos here is to say that among the serving DIGs, among the serving AIGs, there must be somebody who is suitable to hold that office for as long as the president is looking for a replacement. In all other institutions, like the EFCC, as we're challenging the president, there's been an acting officer for that organization for the past uh, eight years or so. And the organization is functioning even though we know that it's a contrary to law. So we shouldn't continue in, in those um, uh, uh, conduct to justify our actions when there's no legal basis for it, Malcolm. Well, we have seen that, you know, the style of this president, I mean, agree with it or disagree, it has been that he's been very reluctant to let people who start to work, let them go. And so the chances that, you know, he'll want to appoint somebody, um, who maybe an AIG or DIG, to just act temporarily, he might feel a burden of letting them go when eventually he decides on who he wants to head uh, an important force like the police force. Uh, do you think that could inform the reluctance uh, of the president to name somebody within the force, um, as you would expect, to be in acting capacity? Well, I think that uh, I've also, we're also entitled to look at other instances when 
the president has appointed persons into critical offices and he had had to let go of them. And so we cannot say that uh, he has a particular pattern in terms of the reluctance to let go of people who are dear to him. The uh, chairman of the board of MPA was recently removed, even before the expiration of his tenure. When the president was on medical vacation some years back, and the acting president appointed an officer to head the Directorate of State Security, DSS, uh, the person was removed even before the expiration of his tenure. The chairman of AMCOM was appointed into office by the same president. He removed him before the expiration of his tenure. So I'm saying that, yes, it's possible that there is a pattern for the president to have preference for certain persons, but also there are persons that he also appointed that he had removed if, even before the expiration of their tenure. And then the other lesson more is this. This police act was signed and assented to by the president on the 15th of September, 2020 while Mr. Mohamed Adamu was still in office. So the law itself was passed while the tenure of the IG was still extant and valid. And there's no way anybody could have passed this police act without running it through the police organization, the National Assembly, the police committees. So even Mr. Mohamed Adamu himself was aware that there is a section 18 in this new police act that requires him to vacate office upon 35 years of, awesome. uh, of service. So if we take that into consideration, it's then for us to say that the president must also align himself with the body language of Nigerians, which is to say we want to hold him to the oath of office to protect the constitution and to uphold the constitution. When the president came into office, you remember in 2015, body language seemed to stabilize electricity supply until sometime we then discover that, I mean, it didn't last. The president had to go to Germany, speak to Siemens, and also work with other stakeholders for what we now see as 12 hours, 18 hours in some areas. And so in, in most cases, the body language or preferences of individuals will not bring results. And I think the president also has a duty to learn from us Nigerians why it's office, that we don't always prefer individual idiosyncrasies in terms of public office in terms of discharge of constitutional responsibilities, we want things that are predictable. That's the essence of law, that human beings can say, if you do this, this will follow. And that's what the law is all about, especially the constitution, which creates the office of the IGP. So you cannot recourse, you have recourse rather to other extraneous factors when the law itself is so expressed as to what you can do in all circumstances. I do sympathize with the president with all due respect. Maybe he likes the uh, uh, the uh, uh, former IG, but when you look at other cases where the president has tapped on the resources of people who are close to him, people he appointed after they retired from Supreme Court as ambassador in the, to the United States of America, as ambassadors to London, even at 80 years of age. You know, so it, it, if a person is just 59, there are other capacities that Mr. Mohamed Abdamo can be of assistance or usefulness to Nigeria, even in security whether in terms of adversary capacity or even in other capacities, given his age and the fact that he's so fit. But you cannot bypass law, you know, to suit the personal preference of the commander-in-chief. Mm. I'm just, uh, you know, another thought that is uh, going through my mind about the extension of tenor. Um, you know, whether or not this... You talked about a moral burden that, you know, it's going to kill, it's going to dampen morale uh, in the Nigeria police force because, um, you know, he might not get the cooperation that he'll desire. Do you think uh, also that the appointment of, say, a DIG or an AIG would also make any difference in that regard, especially when the person is not certain of his or her tenor, uh, you know, considering the fact that he or she will just be in acting capacity. And then there is always that uh, prevaricating as to whether or not the person will be appointed as a substantive person. Don't you think that that already ruins the person's chances? And doesn't it also dampen morale even further within the force, uh, considering the uncertainty that could follow such an appointment? Well, I think that generally 
within the bureaucracy and the civil service is to say that when the person holding a substantive office is vacating that office, there's a general tendency or convention to hand over to the next most senior person in rank to the person who is vacating. So in this case, if there is a DIG who probably is in charge of A division or B division or operations, it will generally then follow to become a president to say, we already can predict what will happen when the person occupied the office of uh, IGP is vacating that office. He will hand over to the uh, next most senior person. And unless there are extraneous or extenuating reasons why such persons should not be confirmed, we should then get used to the system of seniority. We should get used to the system of rewarding people who have been loyal, who have served their fatherland. I, I would probably think that it's possible to say there's no problem in expecting that the most senior police officer next to Mr. Mohamed Adamu should be expected to occupy the office of the Inspector General of Police. That ambition is legitimate, it is lawful, it is legal. If accepted by the Nigerian Police Council, and forwarded to the president. I don't think that should be a problem for us because in any event, from the experiences we had in the past, even with the appointment of Mr. Mohamed Adamu, so many people had to be retired. So many people had to let go of their ambition, of their career, you know, just to enable him to settle down in office and be in charge of the force properly. The Nigerian police force is a security agency. It's quite very complicated. It should not be subjected to uh, 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 speculations. It should not be subjected to uh, some kind of atmosphere of uncertainty. You know, because we're talking about divisions all at, around the country. We're talking about people looking up to uh, a, a chain of command where others will come from Abuja, go to Lagos, go to Kaduna. And once there's uncertainty concerning the person giving those orders, even mm. if you issue the orders, it will only be complied with uh, invalidation. Okay. So that's what I mean to say that you know, it's to, it to dampen morale. Okay. Well, now that the president has made this announcement, according to the Minister of uh, Police Affairs, where you stand, what are the consequences of this decision of the president? And what are the far-reaching implications we are not aware of now? And uh, what do you suggest be done to avert those consequences? Well, the, the, the first consequence is that we have somebody occupying office illegally. And so that alone can spell some constitutional crisis, if not properly handled. The second consequence is this. The people who were supposed to recommend or advise the president, the governors, the chairman of the police service commission, have been neglected, have been bypassed. So... In that regard, the consequence is that whatever the person who has been appointed is doing will not be acceptable to those persons who are supposed to have recommended him, but were overlooked or sidestepped. That is the second consequence. The third consequence is to the Nigeria police force as an organization itself, up to the rank, in officers and the rank and file, is that there is no command structure that you can look up to, you know, as being the center to hold in terms of organization and operations of the police force. What do we then do? It's not so difficult. This illegal appointment was announced only yesterday. It's not up to 24 hours. Several instances when the president has made this kind of announcement and when Nigerians rise up to correct or to advise, he's been able to retrace and be able to follow the law. So what the president should do is to properly withdraw this so-called extension and then summon a virtual meeting of the governors, of the chairman of the police service commission, and look at all the officers from AIG to DIG and appoint somebody who can hold acting capacity and within one month be able to announce a substantive IG, either for the person holding the office in the acting capacity or for any other person. But certainly it cannot be to retain somebody who has retired to head an organization where he's no longer a member that uh, those things may or not happen, as you have said that it has done before. But we do thank you for your perspective this morning, Mr. Ebonlu Adegbirowa, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. All right, now we're moving on to uh, is also related to the police. Um, as a matter of fact, the police authorities in Edo 
States have arrested some suspects in connection with the kidnap and killing of one Mr. Dennis Abuda, an indigent of Fuga in Esako Central local government area of the state, who is based in the United States of America. He visited his hometown sometime in December, but he was reportedly killed on January this year following his kidnap. The police did say that the joint efforts of the command and vigilante groups, as well as hunters, led to the location of the victim's corpse along the Bini Aho Lagos bypass following a report that was made to the command by some siblings of the late Dennis Aduba. Well, this morning, we were joined by the Commissioner of Police uh, for Edo State, uh, Mr. Philip uh, Guadu. He joins us this morning by Zoom to give us an update on what is going on. Good morning, sir, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, this is certainly a shocking one to the families of uh, uh, Mr. Abuda. What is the latest information that the police has about this? Well, the killing of this uh, fellow is, it was done by kidnappers. What, ha what actually happened was that they were traveling between, through the uh, Benin Lagos bypass, and they were accosted by, by kidnappers. Three of them, four people inside the vehicle, three of them were kidnapped. Okay, it looks as if we uh, lost her, but we'll try and uh, reestablish the connection uh, just to get uh, his uh, update on what actually transpired about that and what the police is doing. Okay, we, we do have him back. Uh, could you go ahead, please? Yes, they were accosted by kidnappers and uh, they were kidnapped and taken into the bush. The command, the command was not even informed until the ransom was paid. Two of them were released, and uh, the command followed up in search of the last person. We actually went into the bush with the vigilante and with all other security agencies that could accompany us. And while we we're doing the bush combing, we intercepted one of them. And uh, one of the victims identified him as the person that collected the ransom. He now led us to the camp. While we were approaching the, the camp, they started firing. And uh, it was a free for all fight. In the process, four of them were, were gone down. For that coming of the bush led us to the recovery of the corpse of this man that was on his way to the airport. Uh, actually, it is, uh, it is very unfortunate that we have this incident. But right now, the, all the kidnappers are, kidnappers are along that route. We will be able to pump them and arrest many of them. We have about six of them in our custody. Why the actual people that kidnapped, the, the, that, that killed this man, we met them in the camp. And uh, it was a change of gunfire. And so they, 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 they pass on. They, what I want to encourage the, the public is that if anything happened, rather than going quietly to pay ransom, inform the police so that even in a negotiation, we can be involved and we'll know how to track them and bring them to book. They, they, his kidnap appears to have some connotations of uh, 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 internal connection as if there is, they, they, they knew him before. When they took him into the bush, when we, 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 we searched the body, there was quite uh, no open injury. It appears that uh, the fellow has some, is percent hypertensive. But the 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 the, the is here to give us a report on that. 
So he, he, the, 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 the shock and the distress is part of the thing that make him to die is easily. But whatever happened, it is the kidnappers that are responsible for the death. We have arrested them. Those who met in the bush at the fire house, there was a gunfire, and some of them are gone. That's the latest about this case. Mm. I mean, a lot of things jump out. This is a really sad one. I must say, but you know, there were reports that he was shot, but now you say he wasn't. So, I mean, that perhaps clears the air. And uh, about you know, reporting to the police uh, after ransom was play paid, you, you understand that sometimes these relatives are told not to inform the police. So, you, I mean, you might understand why some of them don't come forward until some sort of transaction has taken place. Perhaps this is something the police might want to deal with uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. It might be uh, very sensitive to speak about. But, I mean, from the accounts you have put out, it appears as though these kidnappers, their operations are quite extensive. I mean, they have a camp, they have a base, and arrests have been made in the past. In fact, along that route, but yet we still have these kidnappers establishing bases, I mean, contacting family members, collecting ransom, and basically operating what you can call a business. So how come we still have these kidnappers uh, uh, flourishing, as it might seem, even though arrests have been made? But clearly, these things continue. Well, some of these, some of these people, that are kidnapping are products of the escape from the prison, actually. And uh, because some of them, although some of them are from, they have various ethnic background, the, the ones who made they are just young, young men, young men of the, between the ages of 18, 20, 25, less than 30. And uh, the, the fact that kidnapping flourishes is because they, they, they get money from it. It took us about an hour and a half into the bush to be able to get to their camp. These camps are not by the roadside. They'll take you, they'll make you to walk for a long distance. And we have to walk along the power lines that runs from, 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 from that express down to us as if we are going to our ship. So it's not that it's by the roadside. And these people, they know the bush, they navigate it easily. They, they, they. So it, if, if, if you are just on the road, you are just at the periphery. So that's why we have to go in with hunters and vigilantes who knows the terrain and who will be able to, to lead us properly. So it's, it's, they, they, can, they can operate from this axis and move to another axis if they don't succeed. That is why we have engaged we, we, are, we have engaged the police in constant patrol along our highways. And if you see, or even on, the, on that Lagos Expressway, we, 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 you see policemen line up between, be, be, between Ubawa and, uh, and Okada. You can see the number of, of, of checkpoints we have. It also prevent them from coming from the bush to begin to, to pick uh, citizens at way. And uh, sometimes most of this uh, inability to keep constant patrols is linked to, to, to equipments, is linked to patrol vehicles and so many other things, which uh, the government is, has promised to look into it. That is the position we are now. It is clear that you know you have a lot you know to grapple with as far as uh, uh, the security challenges are concerned. This kidnapping that you talked about, pervasive as it is, is just one. Um, just a few days ago, we heard this story. I'm sure you're aware of it that uh, uh, some women in Edo State, you know, went on a street protest, protesting uh, the fact that they can't go to their farms because of, of because of herders that are raping them and killing some. Uh, we also understand that there is a look government chairman somewhere, I'm not sure where exactly now in Edo State, who says that, that certain ethnic group must vacate their environment. And of course, they themselves, those uh, other people, the herders, have said that they 
government should prevail on the people who want them to get out of where they have lived for so long simply because they are, uh, you know, law-abiding and all of that. Now, concerning these uh, farmer herder clashes and all of the insecurity around those things, uh, what exactly would you say uh, is the situation, especially concerning this particular local government, I'm sorry, I don't have the specific name now, and the women who went on, pro on, on that street protest in Edo State? Well, the local government you are, you are talking about is, um, is the, the community is the Ugo community. You know, we are local government. The, in that instance, what happened was that the farmers were in their farm. The, the head up approached their farm. And uh, it was a, a quarrel ensued between the headers and the farmer. The farmer now went back to the village and brought in the vigilante men to confront the, 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 the headers. In the process. The headers shot two of the of the vigilante men and killed them and kidnapped one away. It was then they ran back to the police to tell the police to tell a division in in the community what happened. We went into the bush. We couldn't get them the first day. It was when we went back on Sunday. We were able to recover the two corpses. And on Monday, well, it looks uh, as if it's frozen. Yeah, but it needs to be clarified for <laughs> yeah. well, sure you know, can hear us. Hmm. Well, uh, well, as as again, maybe someone just uh, wanted to be sure that it was him calling, speaking on TV. So, <laughs> so just calling just to confirm because it'll be important to to find out what. Yeah, I was painting a picture. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. he stopped at Monday. <laughs> on Monday, yeah. <laughs> but but you know, guys, don't forget that uh, if you if we can get him back as well, the immigration PRO uh, in yeah, the state yeah, as well, uh, uh, those kidnapped and then released. So uh, perhaps when he comes back, is uh, does the police have enough information from some of those people who have been released to act and move to certain other areas so that the mm. criminal elements among them mm. who are giving the others a bad name are flushed out? You know, one of the thing, one of, one other thing that it would be wonderful to for him to address for us is because it, as a result of some of these issues, the well, they made some arrests, tried to quell some um, some of the rising tension, yeah. and as a result of that, in appreciation, the state house of assembly visited him, paid him a courtesy visit to, you know, thank him and all of that. But one would want to find out how do we ensure that this is it. That it doesn't continue. Well, the, the police, you know, they, they have a lot to do Honestly. in all these cases because Honestly. part of the reasons why uh, people may hit the streets or tend to take laws into their hands is if they don't feel that the law has got their back, in a manner of speaking. Exactly. So if they see that, look, nothing is being done, don't forget that yes, it's a process. If you arrest someone because Okay, looks as if it's because if he says they made some arrests. Now, we're also going to find out, look, how long is it going to take before you get them to court? Mm. And then the process continues. It is a process. But it's understandable if people feel frustrated with the process because they could feel, well, th this happened. I didn't hear anything the last time. Honestly. So, it's so all those scenarios. Very, very frustrating process. No doubt. Very yeah. frustrating. As you yeah. said, the police has their job cut out for them. But then, hey, it's their job. And, yeah, <laughs> and, and they have to do it. Yeah, and, 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 and this mop up of weapons, just quickly yeah. before we go on that break. Uh, he said that the herd is actually shot. Exactly. Shot. So, so it means uh, they're armed? Yep. They are. How did they get those arms? Are they legally bearing those arms? Those are the things. And then they also they were shot at the police when they were trying to get those arrests. That's the kidnappers made. shot at the police. Too. So if you shoot at a police officer, you know what that says from the point of law. So perhaps um, those are the things that we'll see how they will sort up. But we hope that uh, they do. We hope that they do uh, all that they have to do and ensure that uh, people see that these things are being done. We will be back in just a moment. Join us again. We understand that they have a lot of grievances which could be addressed, and they are ready to lay down their arms. 
this is the easiest, the safest way to tackle the insecurity that is that has permeated the region now. Contrary to those who think that there should not be any negotiation with bandits, I don't know who said that. I don't know who said there is no negotiation. There is no negotiation and there has been no negotiation. And nobody can tell any Nigerian about this because we have seen in the previous regime where they have been negotiating with Niger militants, Niger Delta militants, in which now they have a ministry. They have been commissioned to look at their development. So many of them were taking on scholarship to study. And there's relative peace after that negotiation. So the same thing, if you apply the same formula, the same psychology and the same physical ideology, the same thing. We will have peace. We have hope. We have peace in the tolerant areas in the United States. So, will that be the same thing? Should there be a ministry of what? Bandits? Is that what that means? Well, you know, you can send us a message or two from your understanding of what you just heard. Uh, we'd like to hear from you as well. But we've got two gentlemen uh, joining us uh, now to weigh in on the matter. Oladimiji Fabi joins us here in our studios in Lagos. He's a former member of the PDP Edo Governorship Screening Committee. And then we also have Tunde Ajibulu, who is a former member, APC Presidential Campaign Council for 2019 elections. So, gentlemen, uh, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Well, um, let me start with you, Mr. Fabi, on some of these things and how you've seen the way they are all playing out. I mean, we did hear uh, him talk about former... Uh, the last administration, how yeah. they handled some of these security issues. So they seem to be borrowing a leaf from what happened last time out. How does this play out for you in terms of the handling of all of these things? Well, thank you very much. Um, good morning, Nigerians, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, you know, the issue of uh, insecurity in Nigeria is not a matter of today. And, 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 we, we, and we cannot entirely, you know, blame it blame everything on this current government. I say this because this is some, something that um, we've been experiencing even since um, um, 1999 when President Obasanjo was in power. It was just that the dimensions are quite different from what we're, what we're having now. And at every point in time when we had all these security challenges, the president or the presidency at those moments usually respond in such a way that uh, those crises are tackled and that they attack with frontally. But unfortunately, uh, we are in a situation where um, it seems that the government of the day is overwhelmed by my right of all this um, crisis, of this insecurity in the country. I feel so sad, and I know many Nigerians are equally sad about the development. And in a situation where you have leadership that are, like I said, overwhelmed by, by most of these things, and there has not been any clear core strategy to address these challenges, it's really, really sad for us in Nigeria. I feel bad, so I, I feel terribly you know, you know, sad about this situation in Nigeria today. We really do not have to go through this route if we have, number one, a listening government, if we have leadership that are, I mean, that, that are ready to, to, to seek for help when they need one. You must, when you have a problem, the first thing is to identify that you have a problem. So, and I want to believe that they do, but unfortunately, there's something they call arrogance, arrogance in power. I guess that is what's really disturbing, I mean, affecting us this much in this country as we speak. My take is that whatever this government has to do within the remaining period it has to stay in government, they must restore peace, they must restore sanity, they must restore security for us in Nigeria. Well, Mr. Jibalu, um, do you share the same thoughts? Um, well, uh, opposition will always be opposition. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, but however, I must say something that um, non-state actors will always emerge when there's um, a supposed uh, breakdown of law and order. Now, but I also say, no matter how well-intentioned non-state uh, actions are taken, if it is outside the ambit of the law, I guarantee you it will not end well. 
Well, it's interesting that when, when you put it that way, but then it also seemed to make uh, uh, people uh, vulnerable to taking action on their own if state actors do not do what is what is needful you know when you talk about non-state actors uh, now do not forget just one moment do not forget that at some points you know we have had a situation where uh, state actors have called for and collaborated uh, with non-state actors to take on these issues, just as we heard, you know, what happened in Edo State. But state, non-state actors have to show capacity before state actors can, can, can cooperate with them, right? Um, it is what it is. It is what it is, and, but I will um, unequivocally state that, um, well, you have a right to defend yourself. Okay, well... When you say you have a right to defend yourself, who are you if, talking about right if now? All, if, all, if everything else has failed, you have the right to defend yourself. Everything meaning? If everything else has failed, okay, I'll, I'll give you an instance. If um, I'm robbers come to my house, I have a wife and I have children. If I'm robbers make it to my house, I will defend my family by whatever means necessary. Any way saying some that are, are you in any way? Some robbers are broken into my house. At that, yeah. point, at that point, I will not be calling the police. Okay. First things first will be the survival of my family. And whatever I can do, whatever I will defend my family. Hmm. And I believe every Nigerian and everybody in the world is entitled to do that. Mr. Uh, uh, Fabi, you want to respond to that very quickly? You, you, you know, I. Yeah, uh, most times when, when, when I'm on national TV and then discussion borders on security, borders on economy, border, borders on those critical segments of our economy, of our life, and people come to say, it's politics. <sighs> I understand that one of the reasons why we're having these challenges is because most of these crises are politicized. I, I really, I'm really, I'm really, I'm, I'm always taken aback when I, when, I, when I hear people talk about, I mean, I see everything to politics. Now, security issue is a matter that affects everybody. Same as economy, same as, same as anything you want to talk about. But the truth of the matter is what we need to do at every point in time when we have issues is for us to speak to ourselves and understand where we're coming from. It is obvious that Nigeria is going through a lot. And... Whether anybody wants to take, believe it or not, Nigeria is presently broken and damaged very well. And we will not understand how far, how far this is until maybe in the, in the nearest future, or perhaps when this government has left, left the power. So I will not really dwell on them. But my take is that we need to work together to ensure that these problems are solved. But unfortunately, we don't have listening leadership. It's, it's, it's the problem. Sometimes I, uh, I want to believe that, are they just listening? Are they listening? I mean, they're just listening to themselves alone. They're not listening to Nigeria. Well, they don't really know. The president may not, well, presidency may not agree with you that they're not a listening government, given that they listen to the NSAS protesters. They, all, they give them five for five, so. What have you seen after the five, giving of the, the five for five? What has happened after then? You know, it's a time bomb. Don't let me lie to you. Don't let me deceive you about that. It's still going to come. See, it is under this government. You will be surprised to see. Are you not surprised that the, the IG is given an extension? If it's a listing government, are they supposed to go through that route? An IG under I mean under under whose leadership? I'm sorry to say this. Police were killed. Criminals, hoodlums, took over genuine agents of Nigerian youth, and they couldn't do anything. So what are we talking about? If it's a, if this government is a listing government, the IG is not supposed to be returned for even one day. Because I don't know what the IG is going to achieve in the next three months of his return. I, I don't know. I don't know what he's going to do differently. Somebody has been there for the past two years, and now he's going to be he's having an session of three, uh, three months. I don't know what is coming that is very new. So well, this government, if this government is a listening one, this is not. Because Nigerians have been crying, we have laws that guide us. Lots of legal luminaries have been on this, and you hear what they're saying about it. So if it's a listening government, are we going to be where we are now? Look at the services that just left. Nigerians complain every are they a listening government? Look up. Uh, yeah, Mr. Jubilu, in addition to your response, or perhaps you, you want to respond before I put in the next question. Go ahead. 
No, please, please, I want to. Yes, um, I've had one. Uh, has said, well, um, I, I think the last time I was live in your studio, I believe I was one of the people, that was last year, I think about January or February, I think I was one of the people that was clamoring alongside the Senate president, alongside traditional rulers for a change in service chiefs. Uh, well, it's saying, I don't, uh, it's saying in the listening government, service chiefs have been changed. Service chiefs ha have been changed. For me, maybe it will have been uh, two years ago, but service chiefs have been changed. But now the uh, the president of the Federal Republic is the chief security officer, and he appoints and um, he appoints and um, removes security chiefs at his pleasure, at his behest. And then there are so many things we are not open to security wise. There are so many things that are not shared with us security wise. But hey, service chiefs have been changed, and it is a breath of fresh air by all ramifications. And I believe we will start, we'll see some excitement. We will see some morale, and we will see the the the, the armed forces will be reinvigorated. Be you can't continue doing the same things and expect to get the same results. I'm not a military tactician. I'm not a military tactician, but it's all on strategy must be changed. We cannot continue to do this for um, the um, terror in the notice to um, to go. The, a government must protect the citizens. That is key. The military must project power. That is that. I mean, that is key. And the movement, the free, the seemingly free movement of Boko Haram appearing here and there, the seemingly free uh, movement of bands appearing here and there, must be curbed. Technology is needed. That is key. And at this point in time, I am, I am, at this point, I will say to hell with national pride. If any bold technology to help Nigeria, if we have to go cap in hand, if we have to, if we have to go and grovel, we need to get technology from from, uh, from countries that have it. We saw the uh, American that was kidnapped um, not too long ago. How the Americans uh, came through Chad and came somewhere in Nigeria and extracted. Uh, we need technology. We need help uh, moving forward. And then, of course, soft power is very key. You know, which I mean, the government, the dividends of democracy has to get to the people, has to get to the people. You know, the economy. I mean, we, we I mean, there's, there's a youth board problem in Nigeria. The youth board can go either right now, it's not going the way it's supposed to go. And if this soft power approach is not used, if the if governance does not get to the youth, if there's no hope for the youth. And uh, we will continue to have this problem because there will be ready supply for banditry and for uh, Boko Haram terrorists. Um, some of the uh, materials, some of the views that we heard before both of you began speaking, uh, one of them was from the Sheikh who was talking about uh, the way to handle some of those bandits, uh, suggesting that they saw how the Niger Delta agitators, the militants, uh, to use that word, were treated. They have a ministry now. So he says something similar in that regard should be done to address this problem. Do you subscribe to that? Sorry, the, 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 the Boko, uh, the, the militants, um, it was an economic problem. It was stifling Nigeria's main source of income. And it was treated as such. This, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, Boko Haram, I'm not, I, I don't see it as an economic um, issue. I mean, I mean, they, they come up on, um, it's, it's, it's on um, ideology. Where they're coming from is ideological. So if something is ideological, <clears throat> I'm not sure how it, how it affects a nation um, and uh, why, why they should have a ministry. I, I, I don't, I, don't um, I think the Mr. President has done the best he can in the, um, in, uh, given what is happening with the, with the Northeast um, development. Um, I, yeah, I think that's enough. There's definitely, I mean, there should be no ministry. I do not think. Um, well, let's get Mr. Fabi's response. Yes, well, you were talking about soft power, and that's an example of soft power. You co-opt rather than coerce, as it were. But Mr. Fabi, so there's been this uh, drawing of similarity, really, with what happened, as you've heard, with the Niger Delta militants and what's happening now. What's your take on it? Is, is this a route we should go down or, or not? Yes, I, I, uh, every government has responsibility to, res to respond to issues and exigencies, especially if it's a very serious government. Um, at the time, uh, former President Yaradua 
you know, brought in the issue of Niger, it was a deliberate policy to address, to frontally address the challenges at that time. Now we have the issue of insecurity, the headsmen, the kidnappers, the banditry and all that. I think what this government should have done, have an issue, you know, was to have a, to, to conduct a critical, critical studies of what actually happened. I don't think, like, the gentleman in Abuja said uh, there should be any further ministry because there's a, a commission already in the northeast that uh, has been saddled with the development of that of that area. Uh, I remember in 2000 and um, on I think 15 election, uh, the former vice president of Nigeria, Tiko Abaka, came up with programs to, to 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 address you know policy document to address all these all these challenges. I really do not think that there must be, they should be given any ministry. Rather, the government should do more, you know, by looking inward and see other ways to, to address the challenges in that region. Okay. Let me quickly bounce this off Mr. Jibolu, because um, you, Mr. Fabi, you talked about uh, arrogance of power. You talked about the listening government. And specifically now, Mr. Jibolu, there are those, I mean, beyond Mr. Fabi uh, as well, there are governors also that say, well, the body language at the center seems to be fueling some of these, you know, attacks, the rhetorics we have seen and all that. Don't you think there should be a change in the body language at the center, which a lot of people have been clamoring for for a while now? Yeah, well, <laughs> talking about um, body language, well, what I know is um, at given times, um, Responses come from the presidency. Of it, how it comes sometimes, I mean, um, it's um, puzzling to um, a lot of people how the response comes sometimes. But um, uh, pretty much, hey, Mr. President um, changed service chiefs and he declared to the service chiefs that it is a state of emergency. He declared to the service chiefs that it is a state of emergency. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, what uh, my, um, my my brother means by body language and um, all that, and the fact that I'm it, and the fact and then he was saying something earlier that um, things should not be politicized. The fact that I'm an APC member does not mean that um, one should not call it speed speed when it's there. My cousin was kidnapped um, last week. I'm from I'm, I'm I'm from Kogi State. She was kidnapped last week. She spent four days with kidnappers. I am thinking, as I speak to you, I am thinking of how to go to my village, Ekenya Day, to go and register and revalidate my membership. And I know what I'm going to do. I can't just drive there. I'm, I mean, that's ludicrous. I will need at least eight policemen to do that. I will need at least eight policemen to do that. I'm going to have to fly to Abuja and drive to my village. And I know the um, security I'm going to get around myself. What is happening? And I don't think people, even people in the seat of power, and hence Mr. President Dick, telling security chiefs there is a state of emergency. I'm not sure any minister, I'm not sure there's any minister, I'm not sure there's anybody that can just enter into a car without security and drive from Abuja to Kaduna. Uh, instructional that you even made that uh, uh, convention and confession and that's you know actually something very very hard chattering but so imagine that just you will have eight policemen to yourself on one trip it begs the question again of the severity of the of the security situation in Nigeria and how that your party at the center is not really able to tackle the issue. That's the, you know, the bone of contention here now. Why would only one person need eight policemen when there are 200 million other people, you know, that, that so how, how do you explain that to anyone? Like I said earlier, when it comes to security, uh, Mr. President, there's a lot of things, Mr. President, the National Security Advisor will not be able to uh, share with us. And like I said earlier, the president has declared an emergency. We've been clamoring for service chiefs for the last two and a half years. We have new service chiefs. There'll be a breath of fresh air. Like I've said, I'm sure they are strategizing right now. And we're going to see changes uh, very, very soon. We're going to see changes very, very soon. Mr. Like Fabi, this must be... Other... Yeah, go ahead. I said like strategy. I said like strategy has to be reviewed. I, I, I mentioned a few other things that has to happen. We have to find technology. We have to go to nations that have the wherewithal and the technology to assist us. This is, this is not conventional warfare.
Do you think that uh, the, the hierarchy, the party leadership, and government at the center, the presidency, do you think that they're getting this kind of feedbacks as to the reality on ground? Well, I'm um, speaking as the um, Tunde Ajibulu MNI. I'm not speaking for the party, nor am I speaking for the uh, government. Yes, but I believe, well, party hierarchy, um, most politicians are grassroots, um, they're grassroots people. So they must be getting uh, feedbacks. I personally, I reach out to um, uh, uh, people in the party and tell them as it is. And I'm known for that. For well, not putting I, any punches. I, I don't know how it works, but I hope this is not part of what they describe as uh, what uh, anti-party activity. It's not, is it? No, it, it is not anti. I mean, one of my younger colleagues, one of my younger colleagues, well, he's very high up in the party, Barista Ishmael. I believe he was here. He was with you some time ago. And he called, he said everything, he called the party out, he said everything the exact way it was. Being this is not anti-party, it is just stating facts. Uh, we have a saying in um, Yoruba, uh, literally translated, it will be like, um, uh, because I want to eat meat, I'm not going to call a cow, sir. That's the right. literal translation. But the fact that I'm in APC does not mean, we, we speak the truth to power. We say things the way it is. I, I'm so telling you, Mr. President himself, the number one citizen of this country, told his new service chiefs that we are in a state of emergency. What more? So Fabi, this was in music to your ears. I, I, I appreciate my brother for, you know, considering to what the entire Nigerians are saying and like, and like that. But the truth of the matter is that this is not the time to pamper the president or the leadership of the country. We cannot continue to pamper them. We must tell them the truth. Um, when, let me say this quickly, when President Obasanjo was in power and there were allegations against the IG of that time, what did he do? He fired Tafabalogun. When Boko Haram broke into first, first headquarters of Nigeria under IGP Ringim. What did President Jonathan, what did he do? He fired him. I must confess that Mr. President is incredibly tolerant, but his tolerance is beginning to hurt Nigerians. And this is the truth. His tolerance no, is, is, is beginning to hurt the economy. It's, it's beginning to hurt the people. And then and we, we must refrain from that. I, 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 I'm looking at a situation whereby uh, the remaining time of this, of this government, they will make sure that our institutions are working. We said we copied from America. We saw what America did. There was this office that was in charge of when you have a new president, they start the briefing, provide a, a, a responses and all that. We saw what he did. So it, this president has, has the duty to make sure that it's because our institutions are not working. That is why we're having this, you know, up and down and then, and then, and then, and then, and then all these crises at our hands. We must get Nigeria back to work. The others must be reset. And that is what Mr. President signed up for Nigeria to do. All right. Uh, Mr. Ladimiji Fabi is a former member of the PDP Edo Governorship Screening Committee. Uh, we've also had uh, the pleasure of hosting Tunde Ajibulu, who is a former member of APC's Presidential Campaign Council for 2019. Gentlemen, thank you both for talking to us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. The feedback coming through from you out there, um, Olushab, Olushola. Whoa. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like how you spell that, Olushola. Okay. Uh, he says about tracking criminals. Is the use of drones for surveillance and tracking of kidnappers and bandits or terrorist camps an impossible feat for the Nigerian government? Why are we going to realize, or when are we going to realize, we can't win this war conventionally? Speaking of conventional, Dr. Pemusa says traditional approaches to conflict resolution in our communities should be formalized and strengthened. So you might have huh? something like that built into a drone. Do, do. Traditional, okay, pardon me. Uh, I was thinking way too far. I, I take that back, <laughs> if it's possible. <laughs> well, this one is from Chimela, and guess what? He actually titles it Gringori's Son. Talking mm -hmm. about insecurity, I was a victim of kidnap along Ore Road. The locals are involved in this menace. Security operatives should start with the locals. True. Okay. 
It's indeed Geringori son. I mean, you remember Geringori from his village headmaster, and he's actually narrating his own experience there. Well, Sa Sim Gosh is talking about uh, banditry, and he says it's so sad to hear the Sheikh making such demands. I think it's clear who's supporting these bandits. I thought it was said that these bandits are not Nigerians. Now they are citizens without jobs and skills. Well, I also think that, you know, there's a little more to the uh, interview granted by Sheikh Gumi. Uh, I think he granted an extended version. And it's quite revealing because, you know, he said he wasn't afraid of the bandits who are just instruments. And the people he's afraid of are the people in the cities who are their sponsors, people who live with us on a daily basis. So there, it looks like there are many, many dimensions to what is going on, the security menace uh, in the country right, right now. Yes, that definitely we're going to revisit some of those matters and those comments of his uh, and see how to uh, progress moving forward. But we have to thank uh, Professor Naina, Adela Oyobode, Bethel Benigo, uh, Comrade Diary. Thank you all for your messages. We, we can't take them because we're out of time, but we'll see you again next week. Do keep them coming through. I'm Chamberlain Uso. I'm Kayo Deokikilu. Please remain safe. I'm Ayo Makini. And I'm Malko Yusuf. Do have a lovely weekend.